Wow, it's quite a credit. <laughs> um, you know, this is America. We're not supposed to believe in royalty, but I think uh, we've got it here in front of us tonight. It's really very special to have uh, two exemplary leaders here. Lots to talk about, not much time, so let's go to some themes. Um, universal excellence in public education. You each state your um, political lives on that. Governor Winter, for you first, what did you feel was at stake and what did you feel was at risk if Mississippi did not move in the direction that you laid out? Well, David, I can only look back uh, at my own life. And I have seen how education has made all the difference for me. I compare myself for, with whatever success, my success I may have had. I compare that uh, with, with uh, the lack of success that so many of those contemporaries of mine when I was growing up out there in, in rural Mississippi who did not get past the sixth or seventh grade. And, and we were whites. And, and my black friends uh, didn't even get that much. So I've seen so graphically and dramatically uh, played out in, in my life what education has meant to me and to those who have also shared in the opportunity to get a good education, as contrasted with the limited lives of those who did not get an education. And we're still cheating too many young people in our, in our respective states by not enabling them to seize the opportunity to get an education that will make them competitive in every way. It's more important now than it ever was. We could get by with a lot of unskilled people. In fact, when I was growing up, we can't do that anymore. We're competing on the basis of our, of our ability to perform in, the, in this world marketplace. We're in this world global marketplace building here. We're competing in that kind of world, and we can't compete unless we compete in education. You have the same uh, kind of uh, belief in, in, in the power and necessity of universal excellence in public education. Can you speak to why it's so important for your vision for this state? Well, like William, I grew up in rural North Carolina. Uh, when, they, when he was standing on that cotton bale there as a boy, I leaned over to Governor Winter and I said, did you ever pick cotton by hand? How many of you in this room have ever done it? Well, I'm surprised. <laughs> it's pretty tough. <laughs> uh, but I saw poor folks. Uh, I didn't realize, when back when I was in school, the real evils of segregation. But I sure saw the difference in opportunity, uh, not just between black and white, but between poor and better off. Uh, my mother, who was a teacher, a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, another one of our great universities. Uh, and my father, who wasn't as, in, as enlightened as she was, uh, taught me how important education was, and they taught me what was right and wrong. It's a moral issue. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was when I went to one of our universities that Tom Ross heads up in such a great way. Uh, and by the way, I hope it's all right for me to tell you all that I went to NC State. <laughs> 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 but I came here to law school, and my wife graduated here in education, and two of my children got undergraduate degrees here, and the other two got graduate degrees here. <laughs> How many of you have a Carolina degree 
for everybody in your family. <laughs> <laughs> but when I became, when I, first of all, I might as well say this now. Uh, I got interested in politics and committed to it when a great man named Terry Sanford, son of this university, ran for governor. And he ran about on education. I want to tell all you students here tonight, I came over from Raleigh to hear Terry Sanford lay out his 10-point program for education on this campus. I got excited about what we could do, what we ought to do, what we could do, and that if you got involved in politics, you could make it happen. I have to say to all the students here tonight, one of the things that, that has really worries me today is that I hear so many of our bright students saying, well, they care. They care about the issues. They'd like for everybody to have a good education. They would like for us to have equality of opportunity. But they say, but we don't want to get involved in politics. There's too much fighting. It's too ugly. We're going to stay out of it. We'll, you know, we'll uh, work with a nonprofit. Or well, we'll go out and be entrepreneurs. <laughs> and they are, from what I'm hearing, too many of them don't plan to do anything to change things at a time when the, some of the extremists in our society do not support public education. They support vouchers. Uh, they want to cut the funding down and down and down. And uh, I hope very much that one of the greatest things about the, 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 the heritage of this university, a place where I learned my political philosophy. I was a student at State. I learned politics at Carolina. <laughs> 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 and under Frank Porter Graham. I will never forget that campaign. If any of you students haven't read the story of Frank Porter Graham, I want you to read it. He lost the campaign. He lost the campaign with, with uh, racial things as bad as you ever had in Mississippi. And I, I, but, but then Terry Sanford came along, and because those of us who believed in progress and fairness and equality and the possibilities of human beings, we got him elected and we've got a pretty strong organization that's still trying today. So let's talk about some unfinished business today, if, if we can, because um, many of the issues that we face, in fact, demand the leadership from the public sphere. In the South today, we, we are the worst part worst region of the country when it comes to the chance for a child born to a low-income family to get to a better place as an adult. It's harder for a child born poor in the South to realize the American dream in contemporary America than in any other part of the nation. How do we take a challenge like that on in a time when uh, perhaps not many people feel uh, called by the moral urgency of that question, and many people don't believe that we, we can even make progress on it. You two, as governors, um, made the impossible possible. How would you take on this enormous challenge, which in many ways I think is the unfinished business of education, the liberating effect that it needs to have on upward mobility. What would you say to this challenge, Governor Winter, Governor Hunt, the challenge of upward mobility, the, the difficulty still of children to escape the stickiness of poverty? First of all, David, by being aware of of the challenge. There, there are so many people now who really don't understand 
the critical, the really critical decisions that have to be made that will enable another generation of Americans to enjoy uh, the fruits of living in this free country of ours. And so it's a matter of awareness on the part of more of us that we cannot live just our individual lives within the, in, in, in the small uh, contours of our, of our normal daily, daily living. We have to reach out and find, and find opportunities to improve the quality of life for those around us. And that is particularly true in the South, of where we are, where we are still having to overcome uh, those uh, those centuries of, uh, of 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 racism, those centuries of racial and, and intolerance and discrimination, which uh, will take will which takes will take still additional effort. Uh, we have not solved that problem. Uh, the Supreme Court, to the contrary, notwithstanding, we still have so much left to do to provide the basis for equal opportunity in this country and an and, 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 and equal uh, quality of life in this country. And that gap, frankly, is widening. I'm, I'm afraid it's widening. We live under a social contract in this country. It was a contract that was made a long time ago. The Declaration of Independence said that we pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. We pledge to each other, not just to ourselves and our little narrow uh, group of people that, I, that, that we, are, we associate with. We pledge to each other, all of us, and a great country of ours. If we are going to be the greatest country in the world, let us prove it by our actions. Let us prove it by our commitment to making those truths real. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm talking to a lot of young people up there now, I hope. I hope, I hope you will not give up on our generation. I hope you will say, we're going to straighten out all the mess that you may have created. <laughs> we're going to solve some of these problems, and we're going to do it by working together, not by putting lines, drawing lines in the sand. We're going to wipe those lines out and come together around a common goal to make life more meaningful for all of us. And I'll tell you this, I'm 92 years old. I, I feel as if I'm the luckiest man in the world to have had the, the good life I, I have lived. But I can also tell you this, the greatest, the greatest sense of, uh, of, of satisfaction that I feel is, is seeing people with whom I have been associated uh, come together in a way that enables us to have a better community. We must be involved in the community building, David, that you're involved in every day. We must build community. We must understand that none of us is really free until all of us are free. Mm -hmm. And so that's a job that's totally unfinished. We've come part of the way, but in, in the face of the, of, the, of the apathy and the cynicism that I see to my dismay around the country, let me say to this, genera this new generation of Americans, let you take great satisfaction in doing more than you would ordinarily do to make our system work, our political system, our economic system, our educational system, make them work as well as they can work, and you and I know they are not working as well as they should. It's up to you to fix it. <laughs> We can do this. I don't want you all thinking this is impossible. <laughs> Tough as it is. But we can do it. How do you do it? You appeal to the parents and the grandparents of those children. From the time they're born on, they'll do anything in the world for them. If you convince them that it's what is going to help their family and help 
your community, in society. People will still re uh, respond in a, in a positive, healthy kind of way. We can also make great progress on education by joining hands and getting the business community involved to help us. Uh, Terry Sanford, when he ran for governor, went out and had rallies like he did. Uh, he, he, he created something called the United Forces of Education. Do you remember that? Uh, they had meetings, got organized all over the state. Uh, by the way, all of you can organize a, a pro-education group where you at, <laughs> if you want to do that. Uh, but but he, he created the United Forces of Education. I remember just uh, after he got in, in office, he called that group, the United Forces of Education, from all over the state to come to Raleigh to go to the, uh, now the Civic Center there, it's a big auditorium. And as a student, I went down there to see it. And I saw those people just pouring in from all over North Carolina, these parents we're talking about, and people who wanted to make progress in this state. And they were a great force that helped him get his program to the legislature. You saw what William was involved in doing. You know what, Terry Sanford? What kind of tax did you get through the paper there? Was that the service tax or what? Well, I didn't think that. We let us pass the service tax, so we had to spread it out across sales and income tax. Sales and income. You know what Terry Sanford put the tax on? Food. Three percent. A lot of people in North Carolina hated him for it. By the way, he got it through. He put it on food, not because he wanted it on food. He would have much rather had it on something else. It was the only thing he could pass in a conservative legislature who said, we want to make sure everybody's paying it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that means, you all? Mm -hmm. no? <laughs> that was the only tax he could get through. And he got it through, and everybody benefited from it. So there are ways to do this. We can do it. But folks, we got to get at it again now. Let me tell you that, that uh, and by the way, the people are ready to do it. I do see a lot of polls these days. <laughs> and I want to tell you, the people are upset that we're slipping. And they want to see something done about it. At every level, the great support for this university and others, the community colleges, K through 12, they, they love the idea of smart start, or start early. We, we just quit too soon, baby. <laughs> but, but, but we need to all get involved and do it again, and we can do that. The, the spirit of do it again is something I want to come back to because um, you were the bright stars, the exemplars of a whole clutch of progressive governors um, 30 years ago. And some of us would say or fear that the progressive spirit of political leadership in the South, if it isn't dead, it is hibernating pretty successfully. <laughs> but Governor Hunt, you seem to be saying there's a quickening going on. Do you believe that um, we can somehow recapture or reincarnate that spirit of progressive, universal, inclusive society that you really stood for and helped, um, helped us bring about? Do you think we can, we can get back to that spirit of Southern progress and equity? I, I think we can, but it's not going to be easy. There's a lot of big money in America that uh, is effective in our politics because of Citizens United. And if we don't reverse Citizens United, folks, this country has got a sorry future. Yeah. I think it's
what we have done in the past. Let me tell you, all these southern governors had, all these southern states had progressive governors. Mm -hmm. They did. Now they, they're becoming governors, some a little more progressive, some a little less, and so forth. But we've got to get the business community to speak out again and to be very clear about it. We've got to get the people, the parents, the grandparents, the young people. My gosh, what a great thing for them to get involved in and lead. Lead. Uh, I, I really think we can do it, and I think it's a great challenge of our time now. Because we think of all the things we got done. He got public school kindergarten through. I worked with a Republican governor to get it in North Carolina. Uh, and, and, and we can do these big things again if we understand how important they are. And if you're willing folks to work and to fight in politics. I know some of you say, oh, politics is dirty. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Well, let, let me tell you one thing. Folks, it's a tough game. Now, are you, do you, are you willing to let education, and public education in particular, go down the drain? Or are you willing to work and scrap and fight for it? I'm going to fight. <laughs> and I talk about getting ready to throw up your hands and saying, I'm going somewhere else. <laughs> Mississippi was a good place to leave, frankly, back when I was coming along. And a lot of my, a lot of my contemporaries did leave. But I, I'll tell you something else. You look at the Mississippi of the 1950s and the 1960s, and you look at it at the, in, the, in, in this 21st century, and you see the dramatic difference that has, has taken place because some people got out there and decided that we couldn't afford to live separately, that we had to bring ourselves together, we had to make a common cause, that we were all members of the same race, we were members of the human race, and we had to use the diversity that comes from that kind of background to build a stronger community, a stronger society. I believe that is where we are nationally now. And instead of listening to the cynics and the, and the, and the, and the critics, uh, who say we are going down the tube, the best, don't ever forget, don't ever forget this. The best years in, in, in our country's history are in front of us. I strongly believe that. That will not automatically happen, however, unless we put aside these fears and distractions and divisions that now keep us from doing as well as we should. So I see, I see that quickening that you've just spoken of, Jim. I do, think it, I do think people of this country are ready now to change in a positive way and not let the Tea Party dominate the politics of the country in the future. Mm -hmm. So you challenged us. In the film, um, the comment was made about the link between political leadership and citizen leadership. I thought that was very powerful. And Governor Winter, you called, you made a space for citizens to voice their aspirations and the best part of themselves in support of a progressive agenda. Um, what do we have to do, um, the electorate, um, the citizens who care. What do we need to do more of in order to participate and contribute to this this quickening that 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 we're discussing? Um, because the burden isn't only on those we elect. The burden is on us as well. So, what would your advice be to um, the laity, if you will? Um, 
What, what do we need to remember from the history that we've just seen? Well, we, we need to make clear what we want. It's a democracy. It's our country, our state, our community, our government. And, and we need to, in, in various ways, tell the people in charge what we want them to do and what we'll help them to get done. Uh, start at the local level. <coughs> Support people who are, who are running for the school board that you think have good ideas and that, by the way, you can share your ideas with and maybe get them on the right track and they're not quite you. <laughs> and, and do the same thing with legislators. Right now, I don't get political in this room. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I think we need to make more progress in our legislature. <laughs> But we need to have more. And, 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 and so you all, again, need to say what you want, what you need, what you think is right and necessary. Go out and work for people who, who believe that, as I did for Terry Sanford. And also, and I've got to say this before we wrap this up, David. I want us to get involved in trying to do something else that is badly needed today. And that's to do something about the re-segregation of public schools in North Carolina. <laughs> you may not know that's happening. How many of you know about the re-segregation of the public schools? That's probably about a tenth of this crowd. And y'all are the smartest ones in North Carolina. <laughs> it's happening. I don't know how the Supreme Court of the United States would go today if it came up as a initial question. But I know how it ought to go. By the way, one time when I was in Kansas, uh, speaking on education for the governor out there, I met Mr. Brown. It was a great thrill. <laughs> but let's figure out what to do about that. We can do something about that. First of all, folks, we need to know it's happening. And then we need to figure out what can we do to, and by the way, you want to talk about something that's tough to do politically? After I served two terms as governor, and I was the first two-term governor in North Carolina, we moved back to the farm in Wilson County. We looked around and realized that uh, our, our school board member in the Rock Ridge community, that our school board member wasn't going to run for re-election. There was an open seat and nobody wanted to run. And finally, <laughs> just got to the end of the final period, I said to my wife, Carol, you, you got to run, honey. <laughs> <laughs> of education graduate. <laughs> she did. She won. Well, did that the <laughs> She did a good job. She did a good job. Halfway through, they, and this was a time when the Supreme Court decision for desegregated schools was really being enforced by the courts to the point that if you had 60% white and 40% black, that's that's what you ought to have in every school. You remember that, David? Well, so they brought in this consultant from East Carolina University to advise them on how to keep these schools in compliance with the law. And my wife was a, was a strong proponent of changing the school lines so we kept all of the schools desegregated. And they did it. They changed the school lines. When she ran for re-election, we thought it was going to be a walk-in. 
one of the top business people in our district whose son was playing football was going to have to change schools under the new plan that my wife voted for. He got involved, poured money into the campaign, got a group up to work against my wife, and she got beat. I was just governor four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it was strictly on that issue. I told my wife, Carolyn, I was never prouder of you in my life. Now, this is tough. And, you know, I, I, I guess most of the South is feeling the same thing, and maybe the nation. But we've got to do something about it, folks. And we can be smart enough to figure it out, and then I think good enough, we might need the help of the Pope. <laughs> By the way, ain't any question where he stands. <laughs> there are a lot of good things. <laughs> but again, there are opportunities here. We need this all to get involved in. Don't think we've got that. We, we and I have things really going. And to, extent, to a great extent, they've stepped back, but not really. We're with them all, and we work, and we look. And it isn't as mean and tough as it used to be. We just got to work hard. Absolutely. Well, as long as we don't let ourselves slip back, now, we've come so far in the business of, of doing it. The big, the elephant in the room that we don't talk about much, there is is still racism. It's an underlying current out there that bothers me as far as we've come. Uh, and we ought to take a great deal of pride, especially in my state of Mississippi, which has the highest percentage of uh, African Americans in the population, 38%. Uh, as far as we've come, and, and like for almost, almost everyone in my state, it's so much black and white, it's so much better than it was uh, <coughs> many years ago. But it's never going to be as, as good as it can be for everybody unless we eliminate this, this racism that's underlying so many public decisions these days. And we deny, we deny that it's a factor, but it, you know it's a factor. It's a factor, uh, uh, frankly, that President Obama has to, has to look at every day. And uh, until we can get past that, we're not ever going to solve the segregation in the school problem. Yeah, that's, that's why there's desegregation. My, my, my city of Jackson, where we fought the battle for public education uh, when my three daughters were coming along, we stayed in the, in the public school. Now those schools are 98% black. 98%. Uh, we, don't, we don't have and, and that's, that's a setback, not just to the black students, it's a setback to the white students because white students learn so much in a diversified atmosphere uh, that they are not even aware of. And that's the kind of world we, we, we don't live in a segregated world anymore. We live in a, in a very uh, desegregated world, but we educate. We educate, we're still educating our kids in a segregated world, and that's not fair to them, and it's not fair to our society, and so we've got to do something about that. We have been graced with um, wisdom and insight, and may we all be blessed to have the courage um, in our mature years of these two exceptional leaders who are continuing to fight and push on the frontiers of justice and universal well-being. Thank you very much. Go ahead.